Hello, everybody. Welcome to the training, Legal Options for Sexual Assault Survivors. My name is Rebecca Berkowitz. I am a staff attorney at SALI, the Sexual Assault Legal Institute. SALI is the litigation arm of the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We provide direct legal services to survivors throughout the state of Maryland. Um, today, to give you a little bit of a sense of where we're going for the next hour or so, we are going to learn about the different legal options that are available under Maryland law to survivors of sexual assault. We're going to talk about the difference between the criminal justice system and certain le uh, civil legal systems. We're going to learn about the common criminal charges associated with sexual assault and sexual harassment. And hopefully at the end, you'll have a sense of if you're working with a survivor, when you might want to refer that survivor to Sally for legal services. So we're going to mostly go over the legal options available that might help a survivor protect their safety, their privacy, help them gain financial compensation, either for expenses associated with the assault um, or for things like child support or alimony or even pain and suffering damages. We're going to talk about options related to housing. We're going to talk about specific options for if the survivor is undocumented, for if the assault or harassment occurs in the context, context of their employment or education. And then finally, if the assault or harassment occurs in the context of the family, a domestic situation. When we talk about using the law to address a survivor's safety, um, a lot of what Sally does is we help survivors petition for peace or protective orders. Both of these orders are essentially stay away orders, sometimes called restraining orders. They're a piece of paper from a judge that says that the respondent, who is the perpetrator, is not allowed to contact the petitioner, who is the survivor or the person petitioning on behalf of the survivor. The difference between the two is who is eligible for them, what kind of relief the court can give, um, and how long they are. A way to think about it is the protective order is like the big brother of the peace order. It is the better, stronger, longer order. But a survivor is only eligible to petition, to petition for one or the other, depending on some circumstances. For the most part, to be eligible for the protective order, that better, stronger, longer order, there has to be some kind of legal relationship between the petitioner and the respondent, um, either that they are current or former spouses, that they're related by blood marriage or adoption, that they're parent or step-parent, child or stepchild, um, that they have a child in common, regardless of if they were ever married or if it's a vulnerable adult. Um, in addition to those legally recognized relationships, People who have had a consensual sexual relationship within the past year are eligible to petition for the protective order. So they didn't have to be married. It could have been a dating relationship. It could have just been a sexual relationship. And then a relatively new law is if there is no other relationship, you can still petition for the protective order if you're petitioning based on a rape or sex offense that has occurred within the past six months. If none of those things apply, then you have to petition for the peace order, which doesn't last quite as long and doesn't give quite as much relief. So anyone who is not named in that category there on the left is only eligible for the peace order. In addition, a relatively new law um, is that an employer can petition for a peace order on behalf of an employee. So if an employer finds that one of their employees is maybe being harassed, maybe the um, respondent is showing up at the workplace, the employer can petition on the employee's behalf, even without the employee's participation. If the employee doesn't participate, the employer is not allowed to retaliate or punish them in any way, but they can still go ahead with this process to protect their employee and maybe protect their other employees who are in that workplace. In order to get a peace or protective order, what you have to show the court is that an act of abuse has occurred. And the statute lays out what counts as an act of abuse. Um, for protective orders, it's going to be any act that causes serious bodily harm or fear of imminent serious bodily harm, any assault, any rape or sexual offense, false imprisonment, stalking, and um, newly that includes a lot of forms of cyber stalking, any kind of vulnerable adult or child abuse, and any act of revenge porn, which we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. All of those things are grounds for protective order. For the peace order, it includes all of those protective order grounds, plus any act of harassment, trespass, malicious destruction of property, misuse of telephone facilities or electronic communications, um, or an act of visual surveillance. 
So that's the one place where the peace order is maybe a little broader than the protective order. Um, there are a few more kinds of conduct it covers, um, but for the most part, the protective order is, is more expansive than the peace order. First, there are a couple of barriers to getting a peace order that are not in place for the protective order. To get a peace order, you have to show the court not just that the act of abuse occurred, but that it's likely to occur again. There's a likelihood of recurrence unless the court issues a peace order. What that looks like in practice is maybe um, someone petitions against somebody they met on, you know, on a bus or at their friend's wedding and, and the respondent doesn't live in the state or doesn't know where the petitioner lives. A court might say, this may have happened, but I don't believe it's going to happen again um, and deny the peace order on that grounds. In addition, and much more importantly, you have to petition for a peace order within 30 days of the act of abuse. 30 days, so it's a pretty quick deadline. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily get it together to talk to an attorney and, and learn about their options within 30 days. Um, so that is a barrier that is not present for the protective order. For the protective order, um, there really are no time limitations if you have that one of those legally recognized relationships. If you don't have a legally recognized relationship and you're petitioning based on a sex offense, you do have to worry about that six months. It has to have happened in the last six months. Um, but for the most part, it's just a lot more time to get the protective order. And, and we talk to people all the time who unfortunately call us you know, on day 31 or day 32 and aren't necessarily gonna be eligible for a peace order. Another thing to note is that if the respondent is a minor, if they're under 18 years old, then the petitioner is only gonna be eligible for a peace order. You can't get a protective order against a minor. So you also have to worry about that 30 day deadline if the respondent is a minor, regardless of the relationship. If you're able to show the court that that act of abuse has occurred or if the respondent consents, um, under the protective order, the court can give a lot of different kinds of relief. No matter what, it's going to say stay away and no contact. The respondent is not going to be allowed to have direct contact for the most part with the petitioner. In addition, under the protective order statutes, the court can order the respondent to vacate a home that the parties share. They can award temporary custody and visitation of children the parties have in common. They can award emergency family maintenance to the petitioner, and that's going to be financial compensation that essentially is like child support or alimony if the respondent has a legal duty to financially support the petitioner. They can order the respondent to attend counseling, um, that could be anger management or drug and alcohol abuse counseling. They can award the petitioner use and possession of a home or car or pets that the parties have in common. And then federal law says that the court has to order removal of firearms for the duration of the protective order. And that's actually not at the court's discretion. If there's a protective order in place, the respondent is not allowed to use or possess firearms for the duration of the order. In addition to all of those things, there's this catch-all provision where the court can order, quote, any relief necessary uh, to protect the survivor. So that might be whatever the case calls for, but there's a little bit of wiggle room so that these, these orders can be tailored to the situation. For peace orders, it's intentionally very narrow. The court can only order that stay away and no contact. Um, technically, they can order counseling for the respondent, but that is very rare. I've never seen a peace order order counseling. I've only seen it say stay away and no contact. Unlike in some other states, like in D.C., for example, stay away does not mean stay a certain number of feet away. Um, it just means stay away from that person, but it can include specific addresses where the person goes. So an order might say stay away from this person, but also stay away from their address, their school, their child's school, their child's daycare, their place of employment, any, anywhere that they regularly go. The respondent will not be allowed um, in that building or on the grounds. So when I said that the protective order is the big brother, one of the big reasons is that it just lasts longer. Protective orders uh, initially are usually in place for up to one year. They can be extended for additional six months if you show good cause. They can be extended for up to two years if another act of abuse occurs or if the respondent consents. And then Maryland also has something called a permanent protective order, where if the respondent is criminally convicted for the same conduct for which the petitioner got the protective order, and they're sentenced to more than five years, um, and they've served one year already of that five-year sentence, the petitioner can ask for a permanent protective order that will be in place for the life of the parties.
that's a very narrow set of circumstances, um, but when it applies, it's just kind of a checklist you have to show to the court and they can grant you that, that protective order for life. Good cause um, can mean a couple of different things. It can mean um, that the protective order was violated. That could be good cause. A common example of good cause we see is if the parties have a family law case, like a custody case or a divorce case, and that case isn't going to be over before the protective order expires and the protective order um, provides for things like custody and visitation or emergency family maintenance, we might say to the court, uh, we'd like to extend this protective order because it's essentially a um, temporary order that needs to be in place until they can resolve their family law case, which will take a much longer than that one year period. Peace orders right off the bat only last half as long, up to six months. They can also be extended for six months for good cause, like a protective order, but there is no such thing as a permanent peace order. The process for uh, petitioning for either a peace order or a protective order is designed to be very fast because it's designed to address the survivor's immediate safety. Um, it's mostly the same process for each, except that for the protective order, you can petition in either a district or a circuit court. Peace orders will start in the district court. If something happens um, at a time when the courts are closed, so say it's, it's nighttime or it's a weekend and it's kind of an emergency, a survivor can go to their local commissioner's office. Every jurisdiction has a commissioner, at least one commissioner's office will be open 24 seven and they can petition there for what's called an interim piece of protective order. That order is pretty much going to be in place until the next day or the next Monday when the survivor can get into court and see a judge. Usually that process starts at the temporary protective order process. So there's no commissioner, you wait until normal court hours, the petitioner goes to court, fills out paperwork, um, and then sees a judge that same day. If what they explain to the judge constitutes an act of abuse under the statute, the judge should issue them a temporary protective order. That order is usually going to be in place for about one week, during which time the local sheriff's office will serve the respondent with the temporary order. That's usually when the respondent is aware that this process is, is happening, that someone's petitioning for something against them. And then everyone can come back usually about a week later for a final piece of protective order hearing. At the final hearing, it can either be like a little trial if the respondent wants to contest the petition. Um, you can put on evidence, certainly the the petitioner will have to testify, um, but you also can bring in witnesses or show text messages or anything you have. The respondent can testify, but doesn't have to, but has equal opportunity to present evidence and, and put on witnesses. And then the judge will make a finding by a preponderance of the evidence, whether or not an act of abuse has occurred. Um, preponderance of the evidence is theoretically a really low legal standard. It means more likely than not, or 51% likely. I think some judges apply a little higher standard sort of unofficially, um, but that is theoretically all you have to do is show that more likely than not, this abuse occurred. The respondent also has the option of consenting to the protective order or the peace order in what's called a consent without admission. So basically they say, you know what, I will agree to the terms of this order. Violating this order could still be a crime, but I'm not admitting I did anything wrong and the court is not making any kind of finding against me. That's often the best outcome. It saves the survivor from having to testify and saves them from the uncertainty of the hearing process. Um, if the respondent does not show up and there has been service, there's a default hearing. So those are pretty easy because there's nobody on the other side putting on any evidence against you. You survivors will have to testify and tell their story, but they won't be cross-examined. Um, if they don't show up and there hasn't been service, then the court will just keep setting the hearing for another week, another week, another week. In a peace order case, the court will set that hearing essentially once a week, every week until there's service, and the survivor has to show up each time to get a new date. In a protective order hearing, the court will set a new hearing once a week, every week until there's service, but the survivor can ask for a waiver of appearance meaning they don't have to physically come to court again unless and until there has been service. So that can be a huge pain for petitioners of peace orders, but it's a great option for petitioners of protective orders. The last thing I'll say about the peace and protective order laws in Maryland is Maryland has a provision in their um, real estate code that says that survivors are entitled to terminate a lease with 30 days notice 
if they can show they're the victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. And the way they show that is by having a peace or protective order. So in this situation, it doesn't matter if there's any connection between the assault and the respondent and where the petitioner lives. You don't have to show that you're in danger in your home or anything like that. You can just say to a landlord, I'm moving out in 30 days. Here's a copy of my protective order. See ya. Um, some landlords might push back on this, and that's a great time to have a Sally attorney involved and, and write a sort of sternly worded legal letter to the landlord. But the law is, is pretty clear that if you have that order showing you're the victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, you are allowed to terminate a lease with 30 days notice. Sally also works with a fair number of undocumented survivors of sexual violence or their family members because there are some specific immigration options that are available to people based on their status as a survivor. The most common one we do is the U visa or U non-immigrant status. This is a visa that gives victims of serious crimes who cooperate fully with law enforcement the right to live and work in the United States, legal status. So they have to be the victim of a crime um, or related to somebody who's the victim of the crime. They have to have suffered some kind of mental or physical harm and they have to have cooperated with law enforcement. That doesn't mean that there was necessarily charges brought or that the person was convicted of a crime, but at the very least, they reported it to the police, they were willing to be interviewed. If there was a trial, they were willing to testify, things of that nature. So the U visa is a great option for undocumented survivors. Um, the problem with the U visa is that the government only issues 10,000 per year. And there have been more than 10,000 applicants every year since the program started. So there's a very long wait list. The wait list has been um, in the past between 10 and 14 years long. So even after you complete the U visa application, um, which is pretty lengthy and complicated, you're not going to actually get that U visa for a very long time. However, it is still a good idea to go ahead and apply and, and be on that wait list with conditional approval because that can provide protection against deportation in some situations. We'll also help survivors petition for a T visa. A T visa is exactly like the U visa, except for it's only available to victims of trafficking. That's what the T stands for. Human trafficking, whether labor trafficking or sex trafficking, um, if they cooperate with law enforcement, they can petition for the T visa. T visas also have a 10,000 cap per year, but there is no wait list because it's a much more narrow set of circumstances and I don't believe there have ever been 10,000 applicants in a single year. Lastly, we will help survivors petition for VAWA self petitions. Um, that's available to victims of domestic violence who are married to a US citizen or green card holder. I think the idea is that if you're married to a citizen, you're probably depending on your marriage to gain that legal status. And you shouldn't have to stay in an abusive marriage in order to petition for legal status. So this gives you an avenue to petition on your own behalf if you can show that you're a survivor of domestic violence and that your spouse is a citizen. We also represent a fair number of survivors who have experienced either sexual assault or sexual harassment in their workplaces. If someone experiences sexual harassment at work, um, they can't just necessarily immediately sue their employer for that harassment or um, for discriminating against them based on their sex. First, they have to go through an administrative process before they can get into court. Um, an employer in the state of Maryland is anyone who has one or more full-time employees. That's actually a relatively new law. The federal law still defines employer as someone who has 15 or more full-time employees, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, in 2018, Maryland really expanded its employment discrimination law, so it's a lot easier to protect your rights as a worker in Maryland than it is under federal law. If you go through that administrative process, um, some of the things you might be able to get include firing the person who's responsible for the harassment or having the workplace update their complaint and harassment policies. More commonly, you're petitioning for things like lost wages um, or financial award for, for sort of the harassment you've had to endure. Sally will work with survivors who are experiencing workplace harassment by helping them file that administrative claim, either with the EEOC, which is the federal body, or with the state or county equivalent. So for example, um, with the Montgomery County Office of Human Rights, they're the office in Montgomery County tasked with enforcing employment discrimination laws. 
you have a two-year deadline to file these complaints. That's a timeline that was recently expanded. Um, the way the process works is you file a complaint, the investigator, whether it's EEOC or the local equivalent, will collect evidence, take statements, ask for more information. They will probably try to have some kind of conciliation or mediation effort um, if they find probable cause that harassment occurred. And then if that fails, that is when the survivor might be able to get into court and actually sue the person responsible. An important thing to note about employment discrimination is you're not necessarily suing the perpetrator of the harassment themselves. You might just be suing the employer or the boss for their liability for that harassment. Um, they have liability if, in a couple situations, if, for example, someone's experiencing harassment from a coworker or a customer and they report it to their employer and their employer doesn't do anything about it and harassment continues, or if the harasser is actually the boss, somebody who has um, supervisory authority over the survivor, or if the survivor reports harassment to the employer and the employer retaliates against them for that report. So maybe fires them or cuts their hours or changes their wages in response to that report. Those are all ways in which the employer might be liable for workplace harassment, even if they are not themselves the harasser. The last thing I'll say about employment discrimination is that um, undocumented immigrants who don't have legal permission to work in the United States can still file these petitions. It's still illegal to discriminate against somebody or harass somebody in the workplace, um, even if they are undocumented. However, what they can recover through this process is more limited. Um, for example, if they were fired in retaliation or they lost wages, they won't be able to get rehired or recover their lost wages because they weren't theoretically legally earning those wages to begin with. Um, but they can still go through this process and still hold their employers accountable. We also work with a fair number of student survivors who have experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault in the context of their education. That could be from a fellow student, it could be from a teacher or coach, have an on or off campus. The law, Title IX, says schools cannot discriminate on the basis of sex, and that is understood to mean that schools have to have a response to sexual harassment or assault that occurs within the context of educational programming. If a student reports sexual harassment or assault to their campuses, um, the campuses should offer a formal complaint process. If they do that, that would entail the school investigating the allegations, making some kind of finding about the allegations. If it's a college or university, that will involve a hearing, a live hearing with cross-examination. If it's a K through 12 school, that might involve um, questioning all the parties and having a report issued. It can look like a couple of different things. If the respondent is found responsible for misconduct, basically found to have likely committed the sexual assault or sexual harassment, the school can issue sanctions, and that's things like expulsion or suspension, or on the lesser end, you know, write an essay or be on academic probation. It can be a really wide range of things. And under both Maryland law and federal law, both sides have the right to appeal any finding that is done through this formal process. What a lot of students maybe don't know is that if a student does not want to go through that formal process, which can be lengthy, particularly under a new current Title IX regulations, they could still report to their school and the school is required to offer them supportive measures. Um, they can say, I don't want to go through an investigation, but I want the school to know this happened and the school can give them things like counseling referrals, extra time on assignments, give them a buddy system to walk through the halls so they feel safe, put a mutual no contact order in place between the parties so they feel safe. There's a lot of support that schools can give to students, and this is both K through 12 and colleges and universities, even if they're not gonna make that finding against the respondent. For the formal process under federal law and in colleges under state law as well, both parties are entitled to an advisor of their choice that can be an attorney. Sally will act as an advisor for those hearings, but it could really just be anyone. It could be a parent or a friend um, who will help them navigate the process, make sure their rights are being protected. And if there's a hearing, they'll conduct the questioning and cross-examination at the hearing. If the school issues a sanction, they are required by law to tell the, the petitioner um, or the complainant, as they're called in school cases, what measures they've taken to remedy the discrimination. 
So in addition to saying this person's been expelled, they might also say, you know, we are ramping up our prevention education or we're installing cameras in the storm or whatever it may be. A student has a right to know what the school has done to make the environment safer. The last uh, civil option that Sally commonly deals with is family law. Um, people come to us either because they're experiencing harassment and assault from their spouse or from somebody they maybe have a child in common with, um, or, or it's a child or a child sex abuse case and the perpetrator is a parent or a step parent, those might trigger a family law option. Sally will help survivors or, their, or parents of survivors petition for divorce or custody or child support. Now, obviously family law is a large area of law. Most of these topics could be a whole you know, one hour training on their own, but just briefly I will say that for a divorce in Maryland, um, it's technically not a no-fault state, unlike D.C. In D.C., if you've been separated for a certain amount of time, you are entitled to a divorce. In Maryland, um, you have to show a ground for the divorce. Some grounds include cruelty of treatment or adultery or excessively vicious conduct. Or if the parties have been separated and they both agree to the divorce and they have an agreement in writing that settles all of the issues that might come up, the court will issue a divorce. Um, but you're not automatically entitled to a divorce unless you can show grounds for it. We're also an equitable distribution state. So when it comes to marital property, the court looks at a series of factors to decide what's fair, what's equitable in terms of how they distribute that property. So unlike a community property state like California, where things are presumed to go 50-50 to each party, Maryland will say, you know, who needs it more, who has higher income, who was responsible for acquiring this asset, things like that. And they might distribute 100% of something to one or 70, 30, or whatever makes sense for that case. For child custody cases, the court is going to look at the best interest factors. What are the, what is in the best interest of this particular child in this particular case? What they're deciding is who the kid lives with and who gets to make decisions about the child's upbringing. So things about like, their religious upbringing, their education, their medical treatment, that's called legal custody. The court will decide that the parents will either share legal custody or one parent will have it over the other. There is no presumption in favor of the mother. There is no presumption that physical custody where the child lives should be 50-50. The court is going to be looking at what is in that child's best interest. That could be 50-50. It could be just weekends with one parent every other weekend. There are a lot of, of different combinations the court could decide. I'd also like to highlight that Maryland has what we call a Rape Survivor Act, um, which passed just a few years ago. This is a mechanism where when a child is conceived through an act of rape, the parent can petition to terminate the rapist's parental rights. They can go to, go to court and say, this child was conceived by rape, I shouldn't have to co-parent with my rapist, so I would like to say not only do I have sole legal and physical custody, but the rapist has zero parental rights. They have absolutely no legal connection to this child. In order to do that, you have to show by clear and convincing evidence that the child was conceived through an act of rape. It's not enough to show that there was a rape in the relationship. You have to show that rape actually caused the conception. Um, you have to petition before the child is seven, and then you also have to still show that termination of parental rights is in that child's best interest. When it comes to child support, which is financial support from one parent to another um, for their obligation to pay for their children, Usually it's just a formula. You can find a form online. You can plug in each parent's income and some other things like medical expenses for the child. And the formula will spit out a number and that'll be one parent's obligation to pay the other parent. So that is a lot of the Sally options in the civil system. A couple of things to note, everything we've talked about in the civil system, it's a system where it's one party versus another. It's a petitioner versus a respondent, or it's a plaintiff versus a defendant, um, you know, one citizen against another one or their employer or their school or whatever. Um, in those cases, the, the victim, the petitioner, the client for Sally is a party to the case. The standards tend to be lower standards, either preponderance of, of the evidence um, or clear and convincing evidence. 
And the relief for what you're asking the court to do tends to be things like money damages or um, an injunction, like in the case of protective orders, telling someone to stop doing something or they can't do something. What we're going to talk about next is the criminal system. In the criminal system, it's not one citizen versus another citizen. It's the state, the state of Maryland, versus the defendant. So in this system, the victim, the survivor, is not a party. Their name is not in the case caption. They are usually a witness. They're a witness to a crime, but it's the state of Maryland who is seeking to hold that perpetrator accountable for that crime. The standard by which the state has to prove their case is the highest legal standard there is, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. And what you're asking the court to do if the person is convicted and found guilty is things like imprisonment or fines or probation, something a little more punitive, um, not necessarily just money damages or an injunction. Many survivors call, call Sally and just want to know, like, what's the process for starting a criminal case? Um, so we'll tell them there's a couple of different ways you can report a criminal case. You can, of course, just go to the police who will interview and investigate. If you don't want to go to the police, um, you can go to your local commissioner's office. That's the same place you would go to petition for that interim protective order when the courts are closed and fill out what's called a statement of charges or an application for charges, you can call different things in different jurisdictions. Um, but basically you fill out a form saying, here's what happened and the commissioner might be able to get the process started without police involvement. Either way, um, once, there are, once there is a report and it's been investigated, that evidence is turned over to the state's attorney's office. State's attorneys are the prosecutors in the state of Maryland and they decide what charges get brought or if charges get brought at all. They have complete prosecutorial discretion. Unfortunately, a lot of times they decide not to charge in sex offense cases, and that's really heartbreaking and difficult for a survivor to hear. And it's important to be able to explain to them that when an ASA, which is Assistant State's Attorney, decides not to go forward with a case, it's not necessarily because they, they don't believe the survivor, they think the survivor is lying. It could just be because they don't take on cases, they don't think they can win. And again, for criminal cases, it's that really high standard beyond a reasonable doubt. And um, oftentimes, sex offenses, unfortunately, don't have a lot of corroborating evidence. The survivor's testimony is evidence, um, but without things like pictures or witnesses or, or DNA, it can be really difficult to prove these cases. And a lot of prosecutors don't take on cases. They don't think that they're going to be able to win. I do like to go over the common criminal charges associated with sex offenses. I think it's important to understand that when there's a criminal case, it's not enough to prove that something bad happened or that the defendant is a bad person. The state has to prove each element of a specific crime that happened on a specific day beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's, it's something that's very difficult to do and it's not enough that just something bad happened. They have to really show the conduct met a legal definition of a crime. So for example, in Maryland nowadays, we have charges of first degree rape, second degree rape, third degree sex offense, and fourth degree sex offense. First and second degree rape are both an act of vaginal intercourse or sexual act, which could be some other kind of penetration that is necessarily vaginal, done with force or the threat of force without consent of the victim. I use the term victim when talking about criminal charges because that's, that's the term that's used in criminal statutes. They don't say survivor, they say victim. Um, the difference between first degree rape and second degree rape is that first degree rape has an aggravating factor that kind of elevates the crime. Aggravating factors include things like the rape was done with the use of a weapon, done in the course of a kidnapping, done with the use of strangulation. There's a list of factors in the statute. If there's an aggravating factor, it can be charged as first degree rape, and then the defendant is facing up to life imprisonment. Um, for second degree rape, they're facing up to 20 years. So you can see the punishment increases quite a bit when there's an aggravating factor. So here, for example, it's good to know the difference between the two kinds of charges, because when the police are interviewing a survivor about what happened, they may be asking them what happened, describe this, describe that, and then they may say, did they strangle you? Did they have a gun? And the survivor might think, you know, why are they asking me that? I didn't say anything about strangulation. Do they think I'm lying? Is it not really rape if they didn't have a gun? And the answer is no, no, no. They're just trying to see, was there an aggravating factor? Was there a thing that fits into this statute so that would change what the charge would be? 
So it's really helpful to understand the nuances of the different charges. Now, Maryland used to have crimes called first and second degree rape, uh, first and second degree sexual offense, um, which used to be any sexual act um, done with force without consent. So before 2017, the law said that sexual acts were different than vaginal intercourse, that only vaginal intercourse counted as rape and everything else was a sex offense, which is essentially saying things like, you know, men could not be victims of rape, which we know is not true. So in 2017, the legislature rolled those definitions together and we no longer have first and secondary sex offense. All non-consensual acts of penetration done with force um, are gonna be considered rape under Maryland law. And that can be really different from state to state. The other thing I would note is that Maryland is currently a no means no state, um, which means that in order to show lack of consent or that force was used to overcome a lack of consent, you have to show that the survivor said no or physically resisted in some way. You used to have to show physical resistance. Fortunately, they updated the law to say it's enough if the survivor says no or is crying or shaking their head. But note that we're not an affirmative consent state. We're not a yes means yes state. So if the survivor doesn't say anything, is silent, doesn't express lack of consent, it may not fit the legal definition of a crime. It still might be something that a school would be concerned about or an employer would be concerned about, um, but it wouldn't be charged as first or second degree rape unless there is an actual communication of lack of consent. So like I said, we have no more first and second degree sex offense. It goes straight to third and fourth degree sex offense, and that's going to be sexual contact done without consent. So sexual contact are things like groping as opposed to penetration. You don't have to show that force was used. It's enough that there's lack of consent. Again, the difference between the degrees is an aggravating factor. So third degree has an aggravating factor and is a felony punishable by up to 10 years whereas fourth degree is a misdemeanor, um, pretty low level misdemeanor, punishable by up to one year incarceration or a $1,000 fine. Some other very common sex offense or sex offense related statutes are things like stalking or, or visual surveillance or harassment. Um, stalking is something we see a lot, I see a lot with my college students, um, but it's something I think that's becoming more and more common. It's a malicious course of conduct that includes approaching or pursuing another person when the perpetrator knows or should know they're placing the victim in fear of injury or assault or rape or sex offense, or they reasonably should know that they're causing the victim severe emotional distress. In addition, um, a new law is about to go into effect that expands the definition of stalking to include acts of cyber stalking. So things like placing an air tag in someone's bag that they don't know about and using that to track their location online. That's not conduct that involves following somebody physically, but it does involve sort of following and tracking their location virtually. That's now gonna fall into the definition of stalking in Maryland as of, I believe, July 1st, 2022. Stalking is a misdemeanor punishable by up to five years incarceration. A lower level offense is harassment. And if you remember from the beginning, harassment is the basis for a peace order, but not a protective order, um, but it's also a crime. And it's conduct that includes following somebody or any course of conduct that alarms or seriously annoys another person, done with intent to alarm, annoy, or harass that person, done without a legal purpose, and after receiving a reasonable warning to stop. So that second piece there, warning to stop, is very important because if somebody were to call somebody a thousand times a day and say horrible things to them, that's obviously alarming conduct that would annoy or harass a person. But until that person says, stop calling me or cut it out, it's not a crime. It's only a crime once they ask the person to stop or send someone else to ask the person to stop and the person does it again. So when reporting harassment, particularly like to a commissioner, it's important to know that the survivor has to say not just what the conduct was, but when and how they asked the person to stop. It's a low level misdemeanor, punishable by up to 90 days. Um, however, because it is a crime that's characterized by repeat offenses, the punishment goes up for subsequent convictions. Two relatively newer um, crimes is revenge porn and sextortion. Um, revenge porn is the basis for a piece of protective order, but it's also a crime. It's the act of causing somebody emotional distress by publishing or disseminating some kind of sexual content, either a photo, a film, a recording, anything that 
um, reveals the identity of the subject with their intimate parts exposed or while they're engaging in a sexual act. So the thing to note about revenge porn is the creation of the content itself could be consensual. Like for example, two people consensually decide to make a sex tape or somebody sends a nude photograph of themselves, which is pretty common, um, they're called sexting. They may do that consensually. What's not consensual is the publication or dissemination of that intimate content. So if two people make a sex tape, but then they break up and one person is mad and they wanna get revenge and they put that sex tape on the internet or they share it in their school or they put it on Facebook, that would be revenge porn. Sextortion is a blackmailing crime. It's the crime of threatening somebody or coercing somebody into making sexual content or performing a sexual act. And that can be done not just through the threat of force, which would be like a rape or sex offense, but through threats of property destruction or threats of filing false criminal charges, threatening emotional distress, threatening somebody's reputation, um, doing something like that to force somebody to take a nude photograph or engage in sexual acts they don't want to engage in. That's called sextortion. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about crimes specifically where the survivor or the victim is a child. MCASA unfortunately has a lot of clients who are children. I think we're one of the few organizations in the state who take on these cases that don't necessarily fit into the definition of, of domestic violence. Um, there's sort of two main different types of sex crimes against children. There's abuse, and then there's the statutory offenses. So some sexual contact with children is illegal because of the relationship between the adult and the child. And then some sexual contact with children is illegal because of the age difference between the adult and the child. For child sex abuse, it's really about the relationship between the adult and the child. Um, it is illegal to have any kind of sexual contact with somebody under 18 if the perpetrator has a relationship with that child, meaning that they um, are related by blood, marriage, or adoption, they're a household member, they're a temporary caregiver, like a nanny, parent, something like that. They have a caregiving responsibility for that child, so they are not allowed to engage in any sort of sexual act, um, regardless of the age of the parties involved. In addition, in the fourth degree sex offense statute, uh, Maryland has a law that says a person in position of authority over the child is not allowed to have any kind of sexual contact with them. And persons in position of authority are people who are over 21 who essentially work for the child's school. So that's going to be a teacher, but also a soccer coach, a principal, a, you know, a choir teacher, somebody who, who has a responsibility, again, to sort of care for that child or educate that child. Um, is not allowed to have sexual contact with the child. Now that's entirely different from the statutory offenses or the age crimes. Here, it doesn't matter what the relationship is between the adult and the child, it just matters how old they are. So in Maryland, um, the age of consent is essentially 16. 16 and older have capacity to consent to vaginal intercourse or sexual acts with somebody of any age. In addition, 14 and older, um, for some reason, have capacity to consent to sexual contact with somebody of any age. So 14-year-olds under Maryland law can consent to groping or fondling. 16-year-olds can consent to acts that include acts of, of penetration. However, Maryland also has a Romeo and Juliet provision, which says that it doesn't matter that they're, one person is older than the other um, if they're less than four years apart in age. So if the survivor is, if a child is under 16, so they, they can't consent to sexual acts or sexual um, contact with an adult, if the adult is less than four years older, that's not going to be illegal. So for example, a 14 year old can legally consent to have sex with a 17 year old. They're only three years apart in age. Now there's very good reasons to have laws like that. You know, if you have a, a 15 year old dating an 18 year old and it's consensual, you don't necessarily wanna say the 18 year old is a perpetrator. Um, you don't wanna say that, you know, two 16 year olds, that one of them's a perpetrator or two 15 year olds, one of them's a perpetrator if one person is, you know, four months older, but they're in the same grade on the one hand. On the other hand, I think four years is a pretty long time. Um, I guess the idea is that a high school freshman could date a high school senior without there being any kind of legal liability. But in practice, I think it also means that like a 12 year old could consent to sex with a 
you know, 16 year old if they're less than four years apart, which doesn't seem like a great result to me. But I think that's also the point of these sort of statutory provisions where the law just has to draw a bright line somewhere, some age, some difference in age, and it's going to be a certain number. Um, and, and that's just sort of the way it has to be because you have to draw a line somewhere. So the way that Sally gets involved in the criminal justice system, we're not prosecutors, we're not the state, and we don't do the defense work, um, but we do work with survivors to make sure that they're getting their crime victims rights. As I said before, the survivor is not going to be a party to a criminal case, but they are going to be a witness. They're going to be called the victim witness and the most important witness, so they have certain rights. They have the right to be informed about the progress of their case. They have the right to be present at any of the hearings. They have the right to be heard, which means that if the defendant is convicted, they have the right to tell the judge what they want to happen to the defendant, which is called a victim impact statement, and the judge has to at least consider their wishes when, when imposing a sentence. They have the right to ask for restitution, which is financial compensation, and then they have the right to have an attorney help them enforce any of these rights. So that's where Sally might come in. We will make sure that survivors are getting their crime victim's rights. Many people don't know that crime victims' rights are opt-in, so it's not necessarily automatic that the state's attorney will keep you updated about the progress of your case and run any plea bargains by you. You have to ask for your crime victims' rights. Um, most jurisdictions, if not all, have a form the survivor can fill out that says, yes, I would like my crime victims' rights. An important reason to have a CVR attorney involved is that we have attorney-client privilege with the victim witness, whereas the state's attorney does not. And a lot of survivors don't understand this because the prosecutor is the attorney who's sort of on their side trying to prove that this crime happened, but they are not obligated to keep the things the victim tells them confidential. And in fact, they have a legal obligation to turn over evidence to the other side. So a survivor can't say to a state's attorney, um, you know, I've been in therapy since this crime. I have all these therapy records, but like, don't tell the defendant. I don't want them to know. The state's attorney has to tell the defendant that information if that can be relevant to the case. But a Sally attorney or a CVR attorney doesn't, can't break confidentiality unless the survivor wants them to. So we could be a resource for them where they can run things by us. They can say, should I tell the state's attorney this? Is this relevant? And we can say, do not tell the state's attorney that, or yes, you should turn that over. That's really relevant. Here's why. Um, we also just do a lot of sort of behind the scenes support, making sure the survivor feels prepared if they're going to go to trial, um, help them prepare to testify, help them write their victim impact statement, help them understand any of the plea bargains that are being offered or just the process in general, particularly if the survivor isn't as comfortable asking questions to the state's attorney's office, they'll be more comfortable with their own personal representative. We will also help protect the survivor's privacy during this process. Um, frequently what happens is a defendant will subpoena or request records that pertain to the survivor, things like immigration records, mental health records, education records. In that situation, Sally can actually enter their appearance in a criminal case and move to quash or block those requests. You know, basically say to the court, this is invasive, this is not going to lead to any relevant evidence, the defendant is not entitled to these mental health records. Um, and we have a lot of success with, with those motions. I mentioned before that one of the crime victims' rights is the right to ask for restitution. Restitution is um, money that is for provable expenses related to the crime. So what I, what I mean by provable expenses is it's an expense for which there is a receipt because the survivor has already paid it, there's a bill to show that money is owed, or there's some kind of, of estimate, um, an actual specific dollar amount um, for things like medical bills or property destruction. What it's not is just general money for their emotional distress. It's not a sum that isn't certain or isn't related to something very specific and real. You have to be able to show exactly what that number is. Um, survivors should tell the ASAs if they want to ask for restitution. Sally can help in restitution hearings. Unfortunately, oftentimes the defendant just doesn't really have any money and a judge won't necessarily order restitution in a case where the defendant isn't going to be able to pay it. 
Another way a survivor can recover money for costs associated to the crimes is through CICB or the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. This is part of the Maryland government that has um, a fund to compensate crime victims for harm to their person um, for any violent crime, which includes any rape or sex offense. Like with the U visa, you're only eligible for CICB if you report the crime or, um, or you go to the hospital to get a safe exam some kind of report and if there is any kind of prosecution you cooperate with law enforcement regardless of whether or not there's actually a conviction again it's only for those provable expenses it's not for emotional distress but it's for things like medical bills including therapy bills um, crime scene cleanup if it's a homicide case it could cover funeral costs if the crime has um, incapacitated or debilitated the person in any way they could recover a portion of their lost wages if they aren't able to work anymore it does not include things like property damage because it's really supposed to be about harm to the person. It does not include court fees like the filing fee for divorce. It does not include moving costs or changing your locks. The statute really lays out specific things and dollar caps for what CICB can award to a survivor. Um, a pretty recent law extends the filing deadline. So it used to be that you had to file for CICB within three years, but now you can waive that three years for good cause. Um, and being a sexual assault survivor is going to be is going to be good cause in these cases. One of the challenges of the CICB is they have to be the payer of last resort, which means they will not pay for anything that is covered any other way, such as through insurance or restitution. Um, and they will make you show that you've applied for those other sources before they they make a payment. So they might make you apply for benefits or send certain things to your insurance company. But um, at the end of the day, they are supposed to construe the facts in favor of the applicant. So they are supposed to sort of want to reimburse for these costs when possible. So the only way to recover for that pain and suffering damages, not just provable expenses, would be to go back to the civil system um, and file what's called a tort case. So in this case, the state is out of it. It's once again, the survivor versus the defendant, and they are suing them um, in civil court for, for different things. Um, we tend not to do these cases at Sally. However, we do wanna make sure that survivors are aware that there are time limits for starting these cases. It depends on the tort, but most commonly three years. A survivor has three years to sue somebody for battery or for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Sexual assault survivors can sue the perpetrators of, or sexual, sorry, child sex abuse survivors can sue the perpetrators of their abuse. Um, if they're a child, a parent would have to do it on their behalf. Once they become a legal adult at 18, they have 20 years to start their case, so until they turn 38. It used to be under the law prior to October 1st, 2017, survivors only had until they turned 25 to start cases for child sex abuse. So that's been expanded quite a bit. I think at MCASA, we're trying to expand it even further or get rid of the statute of limitations altogether. But for now, you have until you turn 38 years old to sue the perpetrator of child sex abuse. So the way our process works, if you're working with a survivor and you wanna refer them to Sally, um, anyone who calls us who has a sexual assault issue that is in any way related to the state of Maryland, if they complete our intake process, we will provide them with a free legal consultation, we call it an options call, where we'll go over what their legal options are, um, advise them on what they might wanna pursue, um, advise them about any time limits, and then they can make a choice about whether or not to go forward with any of these legal options. We also, of course, are a resource for you or other professionals who work with survivors. We provide technical assistance. Um, so if you have a question about the law or about options, do feel free to give us a call and we will get back to you. And here's our contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have a question or if you want to make a referral, we would be happy to hear from you. And if you have any questions about this training, you can reach out to us at info at mcasa.org.